Welcome to another episode of Silver Brilliant Sessions. We're co hosts Dr. Mitchell Thompson and Mr. William Lassiter. We're continuing our romp through the Silmarillion, the Quinta Silmarillion, Silmarillion proper now. We are in the midst of unrestful Noldor. Feanor has just created these gems. We've talked at length over the last couple of episodes, various facets of, of what is involved there. We're going to pick up with the end of the, um, the unchaining of Melkor, the unrest of the Noldor, and then move rather the the uh, the unrest of the Noldor, wrap up some of the key events there that lead us into the chapter on the darkening of Valinor. So uh, we want to we where we really sort of plot wise left off is the um, Feanor draws his sword against his brother. There's or the the two brothers here. There's a conflict now. Um, uh, get my text up here. Uh, one draws sword against another. It's the first time that the elf has drawn a weapon against elf, right? So before Finway, Fingolfin, and Feanor are, um, are you know, it's gotten beyond envy and he's now drawn sword. Remember, they started wearing shields and secretly been making weapons. This is really, this is not only the first time a sword has been drawn against an elf, this is really the first revealing of a weapon of war, uh, really, on the part of, of the elves. Uh, and so this this is a really, really big deal, as we as have talked about in a previous episode. Naturally, this being a big deal, he's, um, you know, Valar take notice about this. And so word gets around and they, they call Feanor into the office and they want to have a little, little chit chat, find out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the text says specifically the unrest of the Noldor was not indeed hidden from the Valar. Its seed had been, but its seed had been sown in the dark. So, as often is the case, where we recognize something, hey, whoa, what's going on here? And you seem a little upset. But by the time you notice it, like a mushroom in the lawn, it's already been growing and festering under the surface for a long time. So finally, these things flower up. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we've got going on here. So Feanor first spoke openly against, since Feanor first spoke openly against the Valar, they judged there was, he was the mover of the discontent. Uh, he was, he's eminent in self-will and he's arrogant. Um, and even though all the Noldor have kind of become proud at this point, Feanor is a troublemaker. They're noting it down. He's a known character. Um, but when they see this, now a sword, a sword pulled on his brother, they say, maybe there's something more going on here, and they bring him in for what effectively is in an inquest of the inquest of Feanor. So the Valar bring, uh, um, bring Feanor in uh, before the ring, or rather in the midst of the Ring of Doom. And this Ring of Doom mm -hmm. is, is not, as we later, you know, as later the terminology is later used to talk about uh, the one ring made by Sauron, although that term is applied to that because it's a beautiful thing about, phil it, it, philologically speaking, there's a beautiful thing about words, names, and also terms and whole phrases being used and reapplied over time, over centuries, over millennia to different things in a way that kind of links them, but not always. In fact, often not in the way that you would think, not in a way way that sort of intuitively makes sense to the meaning but save at least that it grants a sort of dignity or severity to the thing being named that way so the ring of doom in the time of the Silmarillion is the term that's used to refer to essentially the divine council where they decide the doom or doom really means fate or destiny that's the meaning of the word tom uh, actually means tom but it's a, related to the idea of what's going to be the outcome Right, so they decide the fate, they decide the doom of something here. That's where the Valar gather to, to make the decision. So it's the council fire, if you will. So they bring Feanor before Mandos in the Ring of Doom, and he was commanded to answer all that was asked of him. Then at last, the root was laid bare. Right, so it's not just, they find out, as Feanor's talking, he's not the source of these things, he's just the flower. The root was laid bare, and and the malice of Melkor was revealed. So as soon as they find yes. out Melkor is behind this, which is, 
I want to delve into that in a moment, but okay. So they find out Melkor is behind all this. And straight away, Tulkas left the council to lay hands upon Melkor and bring him again to judgment. It's like that puppy dog. He's just been itching to go. Uh, and uh, and he goes out to go hunt down uh, Melkor. And what we'll see in the, it's sort of as the chapter wraps up is essentially they play hide and seek for a while. Uh, Melkor goes shifting around behind hills like a like a shadow cloud. And Tulkas is at pains to try and hunt him down and, and, and grab him. Uh, and ultimately, Melkor gets away. We'll, 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 and that that's what will bring us to the darkening of, Mel, of, of Valinor. Melkor gets his revenge. But, but that's the next chapter. We just want to sort of tie up that thread here. Now let's look at what happens with Feanor. So often is the case, something happens, somebody acts out, right? Feanor is acting. He draws his sword and his brother says, well, okay, what's going on underneath the surface there? We find out Melkor is behind this, right? There's something deeper at root and this is what we've discussed in previous episodes that of course these there's these other forces at work often right there's these you know even by the time we notice the temptation to do something we notice within ourselves the thought um you know an ang the anger starting to rise within our own hearts we're, we're really no unless we're really really well trained in self-awareness you know years of meditation or something and then mm -hmm. you know knowing what's going on within ourselves um, and around us for that matter. The time we notice that we're angry, this is something that has already got a very long history within us. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's, that's interesting that that, to, it's interesting to me as a psychologist, that this is something that's, that's actually, it's not dwelt at length on, but it's, it's made rather significant that rather than simply condemning Feanor, uh, and it, this is important for the way that he actually reacts to all of this. They discover that behind even the evil deeds that Feanor does, or at least his bad attitude, let's say, because um, he doesn't actually kill his brother. Nobody has died yet, <laughs> um, although that happens. They see that okay, this is Melkor's behind this, right? So now let's talk. Let's talk about. Let's talk to Feanor. Let's see what we can do to reason with him. But it's just it's interesting this notion that something comes to the surface, but in drawing it to the surface, you discover that it's actually been under the surface for a long time. You see, this root might go rather deeply, uh, but it's only then that we can start to, to cure it. You can't just keep shaving off what's on the surface and expect it to get better, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. And that's, that's just something that's there. But they mm -hmm. have a talking to with, I don't want to dwell too much time on this because we spent a lot already on this chapter, but getting you caught up sort of doing a montage here moving through, the the Valinor speak with Feanor, say, you speak of thraldom, right, to be in slavery, as though he's, you know, we, the Noldor, are slaves of Valinor. Remember, that was a thing that he started complaining, griping about. He said, if thraldom it be, then you can't escape it from Manwe's king of Arda, the whole of the earth, not just Aman, not just this blessed realm. Now, this deed, drawing a sword on your brother, is unlawful, whether in Aman or not in Aman. If you live here or elsewhere, it's not, a, you know, the whole world is under our roof. And if you're under our roof, you're going to obey our rules. There's no moving out. There's no getting away from it. So therefore, this doom is now made. For 12 years, you shall leave Tyrion, where this threat was uttered. They're not even kicking him out of the Blessed Realm. They're just making him leave the, the Holy Mountain. Um, in that time, take counsel with yourself and remember who and what thou art. And after that time, this matter shall be set in peace and held redressed, if others would release thee. And Fingolf had said, I will release my brother. So I will forgive my brother. It's fine. He'll go in a time up for 12 years, and we'll call it all good. But Feanor spoke no word in answer, standing silent before the Valar. Then he, he turned and left the council and departed from Valmar. With him into banishment with, went his seven sons. They go north of Valinor, and there also goes Finway the king because of the love that he bore for Feanor, and he leaves Fingolfin to rule the Noldor in Tyrion. Thus the lies of Melkor were made true in seeming. Right, Fingolfin ends up ruling. Fin or, or um, Finway ends up leaving the throne, so it makes it look like Fingolfin contrived to take over essentially, and and Finway goes into exile with Feanor. But now you've got these guys that have got themselves cut off from the gods, um, and and that sows bitterness. Right, the bitterness that Melkor had sown endured and lives still. Now. We, we will see, of course, in, not immediately what's next, but make note that this, there's this dividing between peoples 
that one group goes off and they go into banishment. He goes sullenly into banishment. Feanor doesn't go so sort of repentantly accepting this as a correction. He's going to go do some soul searching and come around and make peace with everybody. He goes off with his clan and we'll see that they, they actually invest more and more into shadows, into things in the darkness, which as anybody who knows the um, knows, of course, the legendarium, uh, particularly the Silmarillion, it ends. It leads to what will ultimately become the kinslaying. Right, these guys end up slaying other elves. Uh, there's, 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 there's massacre, and then full fledged flight and self banishment. Yeah. That is so intense. Like Galadriel is still sort of like dealing with those demons when Frodo shows up in Lothlorien, um, you know, thousands of years, ages and ages later. So this is this is a pretty big deal, knowing what's going to come uh, that we have here. But um, yeah, what will do? You have anything to say about that? What what do you see happening here that sets up with that? Or that this sets yeah, up? Yeah, there are a couple of things. So the first thing is that um, it's interesting in the in the text how Mondo says to him, "Thou speakest of thraldom. If thraldom it be, thou canst not escape it." And as you talk about being a slave. And if it is slavery, then you can't escape it. Now, um, where does Fanon talk about for all of them? I mean, there's not a lot of dialogue here in this inquest, right? So it's, it's generally just a, kind of an overview. But it obviously seems to imply that somewhere in here, Fanor had said, either I'm enthralled by Valinor, that's probably what he said, or else I'm enthralled to something else like 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 the Silmaril. So I doubt he would actually admit that. I suspect no, he probably said I feel like a thrall to the Valinor. That was that was one of the lies that was specifically meant to us is oh, you know, there was a, three or four episodes ago uh, we just right. briefly sort of skimmed through that. Is that Melkor was spreading these lies, hey man, you guys are basically slaves, you're thralls to the Valar. If you got out from under here, you know, you come with me, then you could be free you could be kings. That was kind right. of the, he's starting to spread those 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 thoughts those lies among the people. So fair enough. So, keep a voice to those. Yeah, yeah. And so Mandos is actually revealing here that Thanor was mouthing the words that had been spoken to him already by Melkor. You know, it's, yeah. yeah, he's a, he's a puppet. He's becoming a puppet in, in this. And um, I think Mandos is saying, look, even even if you are, you can't escape. It's not like you can get away from it. What, what, what are you going to do? You're going to go somewhere that god is not so to speak exactly which just to sorry just to jump on that for a second that same thing is repeated then by feanor's two remaining so after all is said and done just about at the yep. very end of the war of the silmarils the two of the brothers say well we can't escape yeah they're caught in a in a in a in a tough spot you know do we do we surrender and face the music or do we push out and try and wage war on the valar essentially they mm -hmm. they say look if the if the curse is like we're, we're going to hell either way maybe we'll do less you know in their case maybe we'll do less less damage essentially that we can't escape this fate one way or another because the gods are everywhere the valar valar of all orders so that is something that is repeated this pattern of what mando says here is repeated then by feanor's sons way way later in this whole saga yeah yeah um <laughs> it's interesting too that when he's talking about for all them you, know, you can't escape for all them He's talking what we might call fate. You know, this is you're you're fated, right? Yeah. Uh, and fate is closely intertwined with um, justice or a sentence, um, the judgment that's upon you, so to speak. You know, fate is very. You know, this is my judgment that I have to do this. This is my fate that I have to do this. Same thing in Anglo-Saxon. Anglo-Saxon, the word doom or dom was the judgment or the pronouncement over somebody. We now call it doom, but we conflate the words and say doom is more like fate. You know, this is the doom of this. Really, do doom or dom is the judgment that's put upon a person. And weird is the fate that's put upon a person. Or this is the um, the fata, the, the Latin fata. Mm -hmm. So you've got dom and you've got weird. Here you've got doom, you've got weird. Um, and they are very similar to the Latin concepts of judgment and fate. So that was kind of interesting. It, it, only in a providential world can you say that fate and judgment are actually providence. They're part of the story. But one way or the other, the concept is you can't get out of this pattern. 
you, you can't escape from whatever this thing is. You're bound to it or tied to it. Um, I'm very much reminded of, maybe because I'm, I'm reading it right now, I'm very much reminded of what Frodo says to Faramir when he talks about Gollum. I am bound to him and he to me. You know, that somehow their mm -hmm. their ends, their fates, their weirds uh, are very closely tied up with one another. So that's one thing. The other thing that it, it occurred to me in, in this whole business of Feanor is how similar it is and how different at the same time it is to uh, Genesis chapter 3. You know, we often look back at Genesis chapter 3 and say, well, why did the Jewish people consider this the foundational myth? It's because it's in some ways explaining how do you get from this paradisic um, living to the state we're in now here in the Middle East? Because right now it kind of sucks in the Middle East. How do we get there? We were originally from a paradise. And in Genesis, it's the temptation of the serpent that causes Eve to fall, and then she gives she eats, and then she gives that same thing to, to Adam, and he eats, and they're, so they're disobedient to God. So there's a similarity in the sense of the speaking of the sort of dark or demonic or snake-like forces to, to the, uh, the protagonist. And there is this uh, similarity of disobedience. As Mando says, it's a crime no matter, no matter where you go. It's unlawful, whether you're an Amun or not. You know, it's not like you can run away and say, I'm, I'm not a criminal. Um, so there's disobedience. But then there's a, I find it remarkable that Tolkien's kind of reason for the messed upness of the world goes way back before Fa Fanor. It's really Melkor himself that is the reason for the messed upness of the world. Nevertheless, this is the first instance we seem to have of one of the good characters, so to speak, one of the elves, um, falling into that messed upness. And he falls into that messed upness by his own choice and his own personality and his own disobedience. Also different, it's interesting, Tolkien, uh, the Genesis story has Adam and Eve and animals, and then they fall. And this one has lots of elves. I mean, a there's a boatload of elves. Well, there's an island load. There's an island load of elves. You know, and then there are other creatures too, dwarves that have been put to sleep, men who have not yet come on the scene. So you have this whole plethora of creatures living with one another before this collapse actually occurs, which I find intriguing. Mm -hmm. you know, why, why Tolkien would do that and not just center it on a single man, a single woman, an, an ash and an ember, uh, from the, from the, um, Norse mythology, you know, the two, two right. humans. I don't know. I don't know. Just That's... intriguing. And that is really interesting, is that that point right there, you know, comes back to where we discussed the creation of the elves. Um, one of the, uh, the quotes from one of the letters where he talks about how man is actually more supernatural than the elves. You know, his world, yes. elf is more natural in this way um, uh, because they're, while well, they're more like a nature spirit, right? Yeah. They're not, uh, they don't have necessarily a divine destiny, at least the same divine destiny man does. That's a conversation that is, that takes place between two elves and in a very different place. That's something, we, you know, we'll cover in the future, but um, yeah, it's interesting. So like, because the humans, you know, what's, what's ostensibly missing, of course, from the, the Silmarillion is when the coming of man, which we'll, you know, we'll see in the nearish future, uh, when the elves first encountered man, the humans have, probably already fallen perhaps like it's 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 ambiguous hmm. they don't know what to make with these man creatures these human beings uh but it seems that they do teach them speech so human beings gain sentience of some sort from from the elves uh apparently that's it's strongly implied um but and that whether that's explicitly made made um that's made explicit actually in lord of the rings um or the hobbit i don't remember exactly where he makes reference to uh, when the elves first gave man speech to name the various things, right. you know, our language has fallen from its glory to be able to to describe such things. I think it's in the Hobbit actually, um, mm -hmm. when he's describing the the vast treasure hoard of, of Thor. Um, but the idea that you know, the elves don't have an account of the fall of man because they only have an elvish account. They discovered this strange race of creature, this strange species known as you know Homo sapiens. Uh, at some point in man's journey already at play, we could presume that, okay, given the way that the, the context of the elves grew up, there were the shadows of the darkness coming to them and all of that. The similar, Milk would probably played the same tune, basically, with man, and that's you get the Adam and Eve story or some variant of that. But it's left out of 
this account because it doesn't concern the elves. Human beings only enter into this story insofar as they, they, they interact with the elves and move the elvish story along. This is often the case, right? You know, people's own mm -hmm. story of, this, of, the, of their own people, their own selves. You intersect with other peoples, but they're not the main f uh, focus. And so you don't dwell too much on their backstory. Mm -hmm. Unlike Tolkien, who spends a lot of time dwelling on all sorts of people's backstories uh, as we go. But um, yeah, I just think that's an interesting thing because with the elves being more natural rather than supernatural, their full seems to happen not necessarily universally, nor evenly. And it's, you know, there, there's one falls after there are already a bunch of them around. It's not even a first generation one. Um, he's definitely setting up a situation or scenario, at least for the elves, that runs directly contrary to some of the early ish Latin, I don't think like some of the, I don't remember if it's Tertullian specifically, Augustine definitely, a few others that try and, you know, sh try and explain why the idea of original sin is inherited, you know, mm -hmm. essentially writing on the, on the Y chromosome kind of thing. You know, how does it work that we've inherited sin, but then somehow Jesus didn't inherit it? Well, because, you know, and various biological explanations of that. But Tolkien seems to be really resisting that uh, in, you know, he's providing an alternative kind of scenario for at least for the elves this is not something that's inherited it's something that's caught like a disease perhaps uh, because it's not mm -hmm. genetic but it's spiritual it's passed yeah, along spiritual mental mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. and, and therefore it's, it's more of a it's more of a fall of um choice rather than inherit inheritance mm -hmm. inheritance yeah yeah I, it's also intriguing to me how in the genesis story Eve falls because of the suggestion by the serpent that you'll be mm -hmm. gods or that uh, you will somehow make your world safe, I suppose you could say, or whatever it is. But mm -hmm. Fanor falls primarily due to pride over his own work and discontent with the world around him. So it's not, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not exactly. something that's given to him, it's something that he himself does. Mm -hmm. Which is, is that's that's an interesting shift because um some of the early syriac commentators writing on the fall of adam and eve spent a lot of time on first of the, the the really thick irony of the fact that they clearly already know the difference between good and evil otherwise you wouldn't know that the fruit is good it looks good to eat and that dying would be right. evil right so <laughs> they clearly already know so he you know he says you know eat, adam and eve didn't take much pushing you know to to do this well why and then examines why well they yeah. didn't trust they wanted to know more information right it's the same reason anytime i want to do something i gotta find out more info before i figure out before i decide it's that same tendency um, um but you're right there's a key pivotal difference here is that the fruit that they fall in love with is um is one that was provided for them whereas the yeah. gems that feanor falls in love with are of his own creation and that gets back to that question of art and the, yep, the perilous, yep. perhaps the perilous nature of making art is that it's a beautiful thing. You bring it into being, but it can also become a snare for you. And that's why yes. Olmo later on warns, is it Turgon, the guy who makes uh, Gondolin, love not over much the work of your own hands, because this too must right. perish at some point. Um, yeah, yeah, because it was really delving down on that. And that's, that's yeah, essentially how this chapter ends, too, is... Melkor sneaks up on him in his cave and says, hey, man, you know, you, you, you already mouthed off to the Valar. Come with me and we can make a, you know, let me hold those for you for a while. We can go. We can, we're going to make a great thing together. Yeah. Uh, That's an Feanor interesting just, passage right there. Yeah. That's an interesting passage right there where he says, I, I'm assuming you're, you're um, referring to this bit where he comes back and says, friendship he feigned with cunning argument, mm -hmm. urging him to his former thought of flights from the trammels of the Valar, you know, you're, from you thought about just leaving. How about that? And he said, Behold the truth of all that I have spoken, and how thou art banished unjustly. But if the heart of Fanar is yet free and bold, as were his words in Tyrion, then I will aid him and bring him far from his narrow land. Right? So, so, so I'm going to help you out if you're still courageous enough and not just a wuss. Mm -hmm. And then he says, For am I not Vala also? I, I like that, you know. You know, look at those valor. Well, I'm a valor, you know. Yay! 
and more than those who sit in pride in Valimar, than I have ever been a friend of the old or most skilled and most valiant of the people of Arda. So he comes and says, I'm still your friend, I'm still your buddy. Let's let's do some more damage. Mm -hmm. I'll help you out. And what's funny is that it's that that I too am Bella, you know, come on. I can and that's what Feanor Feanor closes up. He's like, you all the same. And so he lumps <laughs> Because it's ironic, he lumps Melkor <laughs> in with Mandos. Yeah. But in doing so, he's actually lumping Mandos and all the Valar in with Melkor, saying, you're all demons to me. And I will shut huh. you up. And he slams the door. He slams, literally slams his door in the face yeah. of the most powerful Valar in the world. That's Melkor. He slams his door in the face of Satan, but not in the way of shutting of evil, but in the way of locking himself up in evil. Sort of like, I can do evil all by myself, thank you very much. That's interesting. And he just gets filled with yeah. heat instead. Yeah, yeah. A little bit a little bit like what comes later on with the parallel of Saruman and Sauron. Yeah. The, the, the parallel between the two. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's yeah. kind of too that it says Banner's heart was still bitter at his humiliation before Mandos. You know, it, it, nowhere in the previous... Paragraphs as it said, Mandos is out there and humiliate him. You know? Isn't that like, hey, bend over a chair and we'll give you a cane, you know, or anything like that? Mm -hmm. It's it's um it's it's kind of like the humiliation is Feanor's own reaction exactly. to this business. Yeah. Exactly. Being forced to tell everything that he did like a like a little child. Right? Yeah. Um and that's why he's and, and that humiliation then works as well, to make him even more bitter and he lumps all of the valar into that one basket and says you're all you're all bad you're all terrible mm -hmm. um now I, I i gotta admit i can sympathize with what's going on here i, I think anybody who's experienced anger can, can sympathize with this sort of business there's something in anger on the one hand that makes you think that you're more righteous than you actually are and there's mm -hmm. something in anger that builds on itself you know you, if you don't check the anger it's like you get more angry and then you get more angry and oh and then this you know and all of a sudden, anybody who contradicts you or anybody who even tries to calm you down is, is the enemy. I mean, mm -hmm. where in all this is Feanor's woman? Where's where's his wife? She's, yeah. she's completely out of the picture, right? Yep, he's long since ceased to listen to her at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. So even his rejection of um, of Melkor is done out of anger. Not It's not a rejection as in, you know, I'm just not going to listen to you anymore. I don't want that life of anger. No, he's angry at him, so he slams the door in his face. Mm -hmm. Which is, I don't know what what else could what would be the wiser course? I suppose I don't know. Um, given the character of Fanor, probably wasn't much else he could have done. Um, yeah, I mean, he's essentially locked himself away. Yeah, hate overcame Fanor's fear. Yeah, hate. He's closed him. himself already in his own Tangora dream. Yeah, the might is he shut the door in the house of his house in the face of the mightiest of all the dwellers in Aeon. That's just that's great. You just see a uh, Melkor outside, like some salesman, be like, "Crap, I'm going to get this guy." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is really. It. You slam the door in my face. I slam the door in your face. You banish me. I banish you. As Coriolanus says, he's kind of, <laughs> "Yes." Yeah. And that's and that's really interesting. And the Coriolanus thing, I think, is a lot. I, I'm, I just, I love that play. I'm fascinated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, because it's such a temptation, isn't it? I mean, anybody who's been stabbed in the back or been mistreated, um, you know, you, you find yourself doing good among what you thought were good people, and they kind of treat you like poo. Well, yeah, you know, yeah. I go off and do this thing, and you end up, you know, naked, stabbed, bleeding out on a. You know, the A1 Strata del Sole. <laughs> yes, I do have. And, which, by the way, again, as a privileged viewpoint, is literally right over there. You know, <laughs> that's where it happened. You know, I'm not far yeah. from there, yeah. so I can really sympathize with it. Um, but, uh, but back to Fanon, though, yeah, he really closes himself off. And it is, it's like, it is a tragedy. It's not as abrupt at this point yet as we see in, in some of Shakespeare's tragedies, but it's. The person who's just closed themselves off into a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. And all they do is just keep, you know, they drive more daggers into themselves with it. Make it worse and worse. You, you know, yeah. it's, it's one thing. Yeah. 
I can't, I can't but think that Tolkien was also kind of probing that that element of forgiveness. You know, what, what mm-hmm. does why why are we asked as Christians, for instance, why are we asked to forgive? You know, to forgive our enemies and pray for those that hurt us. Why do we have to do that? You know, is it is it like uh, Christians just got to be like, well, you, you know, I got slapped in the face again. Uh, turn the other cheek. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think it's that. I don't think it's that. And I don't think it's um something that you're doing in order to help the person that you're forgiving necessarily. I think in some ways it's it's for this reason here. It's it's mm-hmm. in order to help yourself. Yeah. yeah, maybe that's too altruistic. I don't know. Maybe well, self-reason, I don't know. reason, but. I mean, that's that's certainly, you know, in some aspect, you know, Seneca even says the same kind of thing, essentially, you know, the one who mm-hmm. carries anchor around in his heart poisons only himself, right? You know, it's just, it's like a corrosive acid that's going to eat away at the vessel. Um, and so just don't, man, just chill. You're only hurting yourself, right? Um, yeah. Marcus Aurelius says, you know, those, those, how many times have you plunged the dagger into that guy in your head, in your mind? He did that's only you like what is your thought of that person that's only also you right because you're just stabbing yourself yeah. um but i think there's yeah and there's it's it's like that but a little bit more right because what you're you're saying indicating is there's something more than just sort of the stoic try and stay calm cool and copacetic because it's just good for you but rather that it's there's this taps into something more the the what tolkien's got here uh, taps into something more than just sort of the stoic sense of preserving equanimity, um, but rather that, and, and a, a Marcus Aurelius has a little bit more of this too, the idea that there's something in the very fabric of the universe, right? The way that creation is ordered, the way things are made, the the deep magic from before the dawn of time kind of thing, is that there's a broken way in which things kind of flow and that's that anger revenge etc cycle Mm -hmm. but when things are healed or rather the way things ought to be naturally they are intended to be is a flowing of of of, somehow there's a flow there's a harmony well it's harmony right i mean he lays this all it's all musical terms in the idol into that um but yeah forgiveness is about not being poisoned then by hatred not yeah. just so my, I can kind of maintain the stoic equanimity, but that that somehow that then siphons off and so it becomes a lightning rod. It rechant I become a like like a lightning rod that that evil doesn't stay within me or shoot out at others, but it goes right down the grounding wire into into the earth, into the bowels of the earth, and need not trouble anyone anymore. Yeah. Well, also because yeah, and, and also also the need to be healed as you mentioned earlier exactly um and healed by a power other than because the sort of self-help manual would say lift yourself up by your bootstraps uh be manly just go about your life as you said stoically but really that's in some ways I think that's a hollow response especially to legitimate hurt response exactly legitimate because hurt. when i have to forgive somebody is because they've actually hurt me i've been wounded yeah, yeah and you have every like, reason walking it off isn't isn't yeah. the same thing as presenting yourself to be healed yeah so so i'm reminded of a passage um i matthew the gospel of matthew about the, the demons that that uh leave a man and then they they come back later with seven more you know mm-hmm. um they uh mm-hmm. they, they, they they leave and then they come back and they find that the house is empty swept and garnished empty swept and garnished now you know, I, I always gloss over this and say, you know, why or what is he talking about? Or he's just talking about somebody over there. But what he's talking about really is, I think he's talking about this very stoic thing, that, that there's a person who gets injured and they have an unclean spirit in them because of that injury. Any injury causes that un- internal bleeding occurs. You know? yeah. and, uh, right, right. and I think that uh, if one doesn't become healed of that through forgiveness, then what ends up happening is that you try to recover and you end up making your your house empty. And then it looks swept and it looks like it's garnished. It looks pretty on the outside, but, but it's more of a whited sepulcher than anything else. Banner is very much that way because he's he never stops being this noble character. And I find this really interesting in the in the Silmarillion that Banner doesn't become this uh dark kind of um disgusting and warped character on the outside 
-hmm. he's still very noble throughout yeah. the whole story. Right. Um, right. Again, which is why I'm glad Peter Jackson never adapts the Silmarillion, right? Because he probably would make him transform into something else. <laughs> May but it stay this way. <laughs> yeah, right. But it's really, it's more that he, on the outside, he still looks noble and he looks like Coriolanus. He, he looks noble and honorable and strong, but on the inside, he has become something very bad, something very, very bitter. bitter. So bitter that he cannot, and he cannot forgive That's exactly anyone. He's, anyone. He's, he's not this dark power that goes and he's going he's gonna to go and conquer. He's not a tyrant in that way. He's a severely wounded man who just mm. keeps lacerating himself um, and cutting himself off from others as, as his own sons that continue to do, but then you know, in a perhaps a more, let's say, exteriorizing kind of way. Um, but yeah, that the idea of being healed, and, and I think you're right with the house being swept clean, is that it the, so the evil, the, the unclean spirit is cast out, but nothing has replaced it. But you haven't. Right. Um, there's nobody living in the house, right? I mean, that's right. that's what it is. It's yeah. Okay, there was a corpse in the house. We got the corpse out. We cleaned the house, and we left it in the middle of the countryside. So ten years later, I can't believe that the thing is falling down, and it's you know, I mean, like, <laughs> you expect to have it. A house not lived in starts to fall apart really quickly. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah. state of the house is a lot worse than the first. Um, yeah. Whereas the solution is that it needs to be animated then by a pure spirit, right? I mean, yes. in gospel context, that person, that man needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit, needs to be filled with the breath of God, right? That, the Ruach yeah. Kadesh, that's, that's what needs to be there in place of some unclean spirit. Um, but well, just you know, I don't, I don't know if it's, it's, it's worthy to psychologize too much into Tolkien, but it does raise the question here, on the one hand, it has a similar thing happen to even the worst characters in Tolkien, you know, Melkor and Sauron, for instance. Mm -hmm. Do when when Melkor goes out early on in the text, when Melkor goes out into the darkness to seek for answers. Why? Why does he do that? And is that is he going out innocently, or is that something that he's doing because he himself has already been injured himself? And what injured him? I mean, this is really, really the question is getting down to where does evil come from? It's Boethius' mm. classic question. If God is good, why is there evil? And if there is so much evil, um, how could there be a good God? Right. I mean, that's a, that's a powerful question. It may have no answer at all. I mean, it may just be that you just have a spirit that says, yeah, I'm not going to do this, and then goes out into the dark. And that's where it all begins, right. maybe. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's hard to see, you know, when, you know, what made Satan fall? You know, what makes Melkor? sing an unclean song you know go go against mm -hmm. the harmony um that we don't have a clear insight into and Tolkien doesn't yeah. really touch on it any more than you know any and it's just unwise to do so right that's meddling yeah. in, in affairs too deep for us but yeah Melkor does go actually it's interesting I didn't realize before that what Feanor does here is an exact replica in miniature of the pattern that Melkor does he's okay yes, we're is. just going to temporarily banish you you think things through, but instead of that soul searching, he just ruminates, right? Yes. Gosh, I'm going to get those guys. When <laughs> I get out of here. Yeah. And right. that's and that's exactly what what um, what Feanor does, but instead mm -hmm. of coming to his senses, like Max in the land where the wild things are, you know, he yeah. oh, I'm going to eat you up and him sail away for a year and a day, you know, and he goes off with the wild things. They can have the about rumpus and and all that and and then and he realized it kind of sucks being out here just with monsters <laughs> i'm going home yeah. i miss my mom and goes and goes uh, back right there's this idea of repentance um and the, and the demons the monsters come no come back here we're going to eat you up we want you to stay here and he, he fixes a glare on them and he sails back a year and a day back to his home and dinner was still warm right it wasn't even cold his mom had still made him dinner because um, what precipitated the whole story, uh, you know that that whole the, the where the wild things are, you know, where the, the wild things classic are, yeah. children's thing, is you know, he, kid kid mouthed off to mom. Mom sent him to dinner without his bed, without his sent him to bed without his dinner. Excuse me, and um, 
uh, yeah, it's filled with anger, but then he comes back, right? Like that's the path that it should look like. Melkor obviously doesn't do that. Melkor comes back, but he comes back with a vengeance. And Feanor just goes and, and like mulls this over. He just gets darker and darker, more and more bitter. Um, and, and there's something wrong with that, you know, and we should see that it's something wrong with that, but not in a way that's like, oh gosh, how could you Feanor? That's just so terrible. But I think what really is interesting to me is that because that's such a common human experience, I mean, down to the littlest child getting sent to his room yes. without dinner. Yes. Um, you know, anybody who's got kids, you can recognize, yeah, that's really, <laughs> I'm going to put you in a timeout and sit and, rah, 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 and grumble. Uh, is, is that when you've really been wounded deeply, like, I don't know, seeing your buddy's face blow up in a war, that kind of thing. Yeah. Two guys go to war. One comes back really messed up, and the other one kind of heals and writes beautiful mm -hmm. stories. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. this is something that is also very much, I think, very present in Tolkien's own own life, like his own lived reality. Oh, yeah. So, what's the difference between him and the guy next to him? Like, how does he come back? Obviously, he comes back wounded. It's not without wounds, and he doesn't just get over it. Right, he finds healing. Yeah. That that unclean spirit, the trauma of the war, right? That trench poetry stuff that's there, that gets driven out. But but he doesn't become a hollow man from oh. this. Right? Yeah, interesting. Interesting. You should bring that up because I was just reading this morning T. S. Eliot, that very poem, "The Hollow Man." Yeah, you know, and there's a there's a really interesting passage. I just I, I literally have the tab open right here. <laughs> and he says, <laughs> so funny how something is warning. Between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. And then the response for thine is the kingdom. Between the conception and the creation, between the emotion and the response, falls the shadow. Life is very long. Between the desire and the spasm, between the potency and the existence, between the essence and the descent, falls the shadow. For thine is the kingdom. And that that little pat that little three stanza section has always stuck with me. That, that somehow between the idea of doing something and the actual doing of it, there's this empty space, and that's where you're in most peril in some ways. And it's really it's just it's it's really um, part of this because we're about to go into chapter eight, which is the action that results from the previous darkness that's falling in there, the shadow of the Melkor that's falling into Feanor. Who has wow. become to some degree a hollow man? He's you know he's the house, the house uh, that's been swept clean. There's a great, a great image in this end of the chapter two, which I really love, where he talks about uh, Melkor going over the the hills, and and it says um, blah 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 blah, and pursues him, telling that Melkor had fled through the Calisiria and from the hill of Tuna, the elves had seen him pass in wrath as a thundercloud. He passed in wrath as a thundercloud. So. He's angry, so angry that it's like watching a, a giant thundercloud move over the landscape. Um, and that's that's really, it's emblematic, I think. He goes on to say that the, the light of the two trees shone for a little while, and then we get into the darkening valor. It's like, in some ways, the shadows falling between the, um, the, 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 the beginning of anger and the action that results from anger. Um, Yes, and because that is exactly what happened. Like, narratively, he slams the door on, Feanor slams the door on Melkor's face. Both of them are the the rippling out uh, opposite reaction of that door slam. Feanor turning in on himself, Melkor ha, going yeah. out into the shadows. And it is that <laughs> shadow because the action is about to befall. Yes. That is, Melkor's going to go out and find a much deeper eight-legged shadow and bring it back and poison the out of those trees. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. right. Send so, another spirits, right? More wicked than himself. Exactly. I'm not gonna just put the light out of your Silmarils. I'm gonna kill the source. Hmm. That's really interesting. <laughs> and Man, and Elliot um, nailed it. That's that's exactly what happens. Yeah, well, yeah. And I, I wondered Tolkien could have written a story. He could have written a story about Feanor's 
getting really angry, slaying his brother. And then the rest of the story was like him trying to find a way to reconcile himself and be forgiven. Mm -hmm. He doesn't. Mm -mm. He doesn't write that story. Right. So that's interesting. Why not? I mean, because Tolkien is himself, I guess, still reconciling himself to evil and to forgiveness and to anger and all that. I'm sure he was. So why didn't he write his does that does the forgiveness bit go all the way down the chain of command, so to speak, to Gladriel in Lord of the Rings? Is the forgiveness bit going all the way down to um, even to uh, um, Aragorn in Lord of the Rings? In the sense that throughout this story, you're, we're going to see other examples of people being angry or doing stupid things or or having tragedy after tragedy, uh, Turin Turin Bar, for instance. And um, that 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 ability to be forgiven of some horrendous deed that you've done doesn't seem to come in the lifetime of Feanor. Does it come in his relatives or descendants as sort of proxies, uh, proxy characters? I don't know. So this, like, so Feanor has the opportunity, and he doesn't. He's just not even aware of it. His sons have the opportunity, and they kind of go. They they really go from bad to worse. We we'll save the last two. We kind of have this debate. I don't know, man. You ever think about repenting? We, should, we you know, we, we're in, we're POWs now. The Valor have caught us. You know, maybe we should just throw ourselves at their mercy and, and beg for mercy. And they're like, no, I'm going to stick it up to the end. So I suppose you're right. You know, <laughs> I said to them, the ones that, you know, and and the one who, who said no, we got to stick it out to the end ends up throwing himself into the fiery bowels of the earth. Right. And the other one ends up throwing his Silmaril into the sea and moping, singing, you yeah. know, singing lamentations for the rest of his eternity. Because I don't know, they don't die, right? Because they're out, unless they're killed. So he just goes, you know, wastes away at the seaside, singing uh, lamentations about it. But but Galadra is a very interesting character because she she doesn't actually, unless she's meddled with the text. You know, we could always, you know, hypo hermeneutics. Of Please don't. <laughs> you know, in the, in the received version of the Quintus Omerillion, uh very explicitly mentioned that Galadriel did not personally raise her hand against a, a kin, nor did she kill her cousin with any particular, you know, dagger or anything like that. Why would I do that? I would never kill somebody with my own kin. Uh, <laughs> you know, oddly specific references that she doesn't yeah. do. That. No, let's let's take it as it as it is and say that she didn't meddle with the text after the fact. Um, but she doesn't personally kill anybody in the kinslaying. But she's there and she doesn't stop it. Moreover, yeah. she leads the exile. She's one of the leaders of the strong-willed, pig-headed Noldor who say, screw this, we're going to walk across the, the sharp, shifting ice desert yeah, to the actually. other end of the world. And, and why? Well, because she's got a bit of a chip on her shoulder. She, she's not Feanor. But she kind of, I don't know, when he, he was smack when he was talking smack about the Valar. She kind of thought, "Well, I could have a kingdom out there all my own." And she's always dreamed of that. I could be a queen. I could be a goddess. I mean, I basically, you know, she ends up getting quite close to being. You know, she's she's about as close as you get, not being actually a goddess or descended from a goddess to being a goddess. Right? Yes. She's, she's tutored under my under under uh, Mele on the Maya. She. She even named so I mean she goes so far. This, let's riff on Galadriel here for a second. She goes and she she gets one of these rings. You know, once that's developed, that becomes a thing, right? They invent the three rings. And she creates this force, and what does she call it? She calls it Lauren and Dona. She she calls it Lothlorien. Ultimately, it's an evolved name because it's kind of changed its character. She names mm -hmm. her own personal garden after the garden of Yavanna, right? So mm -hmm. she, she 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 kind of she she in her own little world makes herself a replace makes herself to be like a replacement of the goddess of growth and trees and gardening and all that yeah. and so she's kind the pretensions of to grandeur. right the pretensions to grandeur that she achieves a lot of grandeur but she's she's <laughs> she's had this vision this this oh gosh i'm gonna do it's gonna be awesome i'm gonna do it and it's gonna be great and she's bitter so she's you know so there's there's a lot of the similar kind of tendencies in feanor and she, when the Valar say, okay, you guys leave, you're never coming back in this house. You walk out that front door, ma'am, you are never coming back in here. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and she yeah. takes that to heart. She kind of, you know, young her, she's 
you, that's it, fine, go to this thing. But over the years, that, that becomes like these paper cuts is slowly bleeding out. She becomes from unconscious. She's, she sort of resigned herself to perpetual exile from the Blessed Realm. So that's why when Frodo and the company depart from Lothlorien, and she's singing that namarie, that farewell. Yeah, right. You know, she says, what ship can bear me back across so great a sea? She's not talking about distance. What, what ship? I mean, the one that Kirtan makes, that uh, obvious answer. Yeah, right. She's talking about that forgiveness bit, that repentance. Mm -hmm. In this case, not one who needs to grant forgiveness, but one who needs to receive and accept forgiveness. And she uh, doesn't yeah. see a way for that to be. And so this is Feanor's problem. He's he, he, he the one who done wrong. He needs to accept forgiveness and actually embrace the life of repent, the path of repentance. He doesn't. He he pushes more and more the opposite direction. She yes. has a really hard time accepting that. And so she too closes in on herself, really. And ultimately Celeborn kind of follows suit for other reasons. You know, he wasn't there at the Kinslang, from all we can tell. He's got, you know, he's got a chip on his shoulder from the uh, the, the, the horrible blood shedding that he saw when, you know. As well, later on between the dwarves and, and elves, um, um, but you know they they create this paradise of Lothlorien, but there's a it's tinged with melancholy, not just because that's somehow like this really cool, dark, sexy elf thing, but that they're also wounded and have wounded others and are in need of forgiveness or receiving that, and they they feel for they are exiles, right? They're living in a land of exile. And that's why it's so poignantly beautiful that, one, Galadriel refuses the ring when Frodo offers it to her. Because that could be her way to really stick it to the Valar, right? She could become, she could become a new Dark Lord. Mm -hmm. She doesn't. Moreover, she says, I'm going to diminish into the West and remain Galadriel. To diminish in the West, into the West, implies a pathway to the West that she does not yet even have or realize what it could be. She says she resolves to diminish into the West and remain Galadriel. And yet, in the few pages that follow, a few pages later, we know that she still doesn't know what, what ship could bear her back across so great a sea. Yeah. She doesn't even know how to diminish into the West. But she's yeah. made that pivotal point, that, that mm -hmm. internal orientation, the pivotal turn towards repentance. And, mm -hmm. and that the, the, the path of forgiveness, the other side of forgiveness, of, just let, of letting go and seeking that healing. Rather now, than... Remember, and if I remember right, at the end of the story, she does go from Grey Haven. She does, exactly. She's granted yeah. a spot. The, the Valar receive that, receive that repentance. They receive yeah. that, that penitence. And they grant her a spot on the ship to come to Valinor. And there's one last sting, is that Saruman stings her. I think it's, I, it's one of those things. You read The Lord of the Rings, and I've been reading it for, I don't know how old I am. But at least 30 <laughs> years, right? That I can remember. I've been, you know, that that's been in my repertoire. Uh, and we read it fairly regularly in, in our family. And and every time I notice something new, I'm like, well, who put that in there? That was never mm. cool. You know, it's a great book that way. Um, yeah. Never ending story, really. But one of the things that I realized recently, the most recent reading, is that when the elves and Gandalf and the, you know the the hobbits are riding their way back to Rivendell and ultimately to um, ultimately to the to the Shire and then you know eventually they go to the Grey Havens, is that they you know they run across Sodomon who's been you know dethroned and defrocked and everything with wandering about the wilderness with his you know lackey uh, Worm Tongue and he sees them all look at you riding all high and mighty. And he throws back to Galadriel, throws back at Galadriel, her very words that she spoke in secret to Frodo. Both revealing, one, that Saruman's a peeping Tom who was eavesdropping on her conversation with Frodo in Lothlorien. Or rather, not in Lothlorien, but that when she was singing her Namarie song on the swan boat on the river, he was listening, he was peeping in on that. And he's throwing this back at her face to try and agitate her again, to push back against her repentance. And when he, he they run into each other, he says, well, look, you're riding all high and mighty. Everything's going well for you. I've been kicked out of my house. I'm homeless now. You wouldn't even have pity on me, a poor beggar. And she says something, you know, gracious or whatever. And he says, yeah, and what, what ship would bear me back across so great a sea? You think you're getting anywhere by going west? 
what ship would bear me back across across the greater sea? And he throws back her own words, which she's saying in Elvish, but he, you know, he he weaponizes that back at her as a massive sting. Dude, yeah, dick move. Yeah, Definitely. Right. <laughs> and, oh my gosh, he did. Wow. He did. wow. And and she huh. just she's unfazed by it at that point. Well she could have she could have in all rights absolutely just played him like that. Yeah. Yeah. She right. doesn't. Right, right. She's and it's not because she's the bigger man, in fact being a woman and an elf, but that she's no longer perturbable because she's resigned herself to the path of repentance. Nothing can shake her. She's achieved that true apatheia, impassiveness to violence against herself. Because yeah. she's consigned, because she's abandoned herself now to the mercy of the Valar, not knowing yeah. what that's going to look like, not knowing the pathway back. But she's made that internal move that now makes her impervious to the stings of Sodom. Yeah, there are a lot of thoughts, and that's a really good insight. I like that very much. But one of the first ones that bubbles up is just the cheap shot again at uh, the Rings of Power. It's such a travesty. Because it glorifies the violence and it glorifies the daring do aspect of Ladriel, which itself is a fabrication. But it doesn't acknowledge the fact that the real problem is this, as you said, agitation, this youthful desire to control, this youthful dissatisfaction with everything. Um, and that's made into something somehow good and noble and fight the man, you know, fight the patriarchy, blah, blah, blah. And it's just such a, such a horrible trope. But yeah. that aside, we know it's a horrible throw, so we don't have to, you know, belittle right. that. It's just bad. But one of the interesting things, too, is that it's um, it's uh, this ongoing theme, I think, of Tolkien, which is the, the, the problem of being autonomous and the problem of being secondary creators that then runs into an issue when that secondary creation or that autonomy tempts us to want to become gods, to think that we're gods, to be dissatisfied with the world. And how difficult is it? to relinquish control and relinquish power and to say, you know, I, I, I accept <laughs> to say fiat voluntas tua, how difficult that is. Uh, very much embodied in that character of Gladriel and very much not embodied in the character of Feanor, who does quite the opposite of all that, right? Right. He has no fiat at all in that. Well, that's interesting, and, too, because like comes back to the 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 T.S. Eliot poem, right? That in that gap, for thine is the kingdom, or yeah. like, do I it, thine is the kingdom, or do I seek to grasp it for myself? Yeah, yeah. In that shadow moment, in those shadowlands, do I take? Do I seize it, or do I take the opportunity to actually show my character and be in humility, repentance, and humility? Like Feanor, yeah. or not Feanor, uh, Faramir, given the opportunity, right? Sam says, you know, you know, man, you know, you yeah. took the opportunity to show your character, and you did, yeah. you did right by the, uh, in that gap between the offer and the the act. Yeah, this it explains a great deal what you just said too. It explains a great deal that I've always pondered over, which is the what uh, Sam I think says about the elves, how they're majestic and glorious, but also very sad, some deep sadness in them. And I always thought it was a sadness because they just they knew the world was going to end and that they were seeing it pass away. But it's really far more the sadness of of their own guilt and the own the weight of being alive so long and the um, the the thought that they're never going to be forgiven for certain things, right. the ones we encountered in Earth anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and that's yeah, I, I, you could read that T.S. Eliot poem in some ways as being a, a reflection on the same type of character as Feanor and to some degree the same type of character as, as Galadriel. You know, life is very long. For thine is the kingdom. Life is very long. <laughs> right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yes, yeah, right, right. thousands, thousands of years long. Yes, right. In this case, yeah, thousands of years long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the gift that they give that they recognize in human beings is that the men are, don't live thousands of years. Right. Boy, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you knew you were only going to live 80 years and not 8,000, wouldn't that be some somewhat of a blessing because you say, I have 80 years to fix things. I really should get my act together. 
And at some point say, you know, I got to lay off the sauce. You wake up in a pile of your own vomit and alcohol on the floor and your wife's abandoned you. And you're like, not speaking from experience, by the way. But, you know, you're like, um, that's, that, I mean, something needs to be done. Something needs to be fixed. Right. And then there's that eminence of, of, uh, of the fact that you're going to die. You know, memento mori. It gives you this impetus to say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to relinquish. I'm not going to continue in this vein. This cannot abide. Um, yeah. Whereas the elves, they do, and they keep abiding. And they're, right. they keep abiding and seeing all the beauty and being exiled from it and not being able to reconcile themselves back to it and knowing that they've done wrong and carrying that around forever. And everybody thinks they're all great and worships them and all this, and yet they know that they're rotten in the core. And boy, that would be something, wouldn't it? Yeah. Imagine like, like all these characters. Like I remember when um, uh, Sam is all excited about seeing magic and glad he's like, I don't really know what you mean. You know, magic, what you're talking about. But Sam is in some ways uh, really praising them, the elves, as being magical and mystic. Wow, they're wonderful. And all these elves are like, yeah, no, that's... Mm. I may look good, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Feel right. like a wine and sepulchre, you know? Right. So, that would... But be then Sam, I think that's an interesting insight, too, because what does Sam see when he sees the magic? Right? It's this her mirror, Galadriel's mirror, and he, yeah. uh, he sees some pretty messed up stuff, and he can't unsee that. And she's like, well, Oh, what do you think of the elves now that you've seen what you call elf magic? And he's kind of, yeah. Uh, well, um, eh, all right. I, yeah, <laughs> I get it. Like it was good. But yeah. <laughs> kind of wish I, I had been dreaming about that for a while, you know, <laughs> yeah, cutting right. down trees and throwing his gaffer out into the streets and all that. Like you can't yeah. unsee that. And now you've got to live yeah, with right. that, that pain of seeing that, which, which on a larger actually, scale. It, 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 it brings him into participation with that same spirit of the elves because yeah, that's where right. they've lived, right? I mean, that's... On a larger scale, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. His hobbit yeah. size, hobbit size capacity. Well, you, you know, it's interesting, this conversation uh, brings us right up to Chapter 8, which is the darkening of Valinor, which in some ways I think maybe we should postpone that. Um, yeah. You know, we got to the end of the chapter, yay. Yeah, yeah. I like the way that he ends all this with, this is, you know, between the potency and the act, Right. We're in the potency part here now, and we're about to come into the act part. And he ends it with this really lovely little phrase, Melkor departed from Balinor. Hooray. And for a while, yeah. the two trees shone again unshadowed, and the land was filled with light. So this is sort of renaissance that occurs in a way. And, and the land is filled with light because Melkor is gone. But the yeah. Valar sought in vain for tidings of the enemy. They don't know where he's out there somewhere. And as a cloud far off that looms ever higher, borne upon a slow, cold wind, a doubt now marred the joy of all the dwellers in Amman, dreading they knew not what evil that yet might come. All right, good night, kids. <laughs> <laughs> it is very much that. Okay, Jenny, go to sleep. <laughs> Uh, well, I think that's a good spot to finish myself. I don't know. Do you have anything else you want to pass on? Yeah, for thine is the kingdom. I think that's the right spot. Yeah, right? yeah for thine is the kingdom. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been good. Thank you, sir. Appreciate this very much. So, for well, wherever you fare, to Aries, receive you at your journey's end. And may the wind under your wings bear you to where the sun sails and the moon walks.